We'll be getting started in just another minute or so. This is a perfect time actually to look at the relationship of the mind and body right now. And no matter the moment, we have this potential, any moment is suitable for this possibility of something truly beautiful and liberating to show up, which is the mind always has this capacity to be relating to the body, to be knowing the body in a beautiful way in a liberated way. In the same way, it's always possible, like in this moment even, for the mind to have a hellish relationship to the body, the bodily experience, for there the relationship to be characterized by a lot of denial or resistance or total hatred <laughs> or greed, really wanting something out of the experience of the body. And the more we practice with mindfulness of body, it's like I sometimes say, you know, if we knew there were, you know, gold coins in our house, but they were hidden, we'd probably spend some time looking for them because they're valuable. And so, in the course of our practice, if we've uncovered moments where <clears throat> the heart is relating to the body in this beautiful, wholesome, liberating way, and we felt the healing of that and the insight and the pleasure of that, well, then we'd be really curious about like, well, how about this moment? Is that freedom available in this moment. And the reason we get thrown off, this is a good thing <clears throat> to mention at the beginning of a sitting period, which is while I'm taking, why I'm taking the time now. You know, when we, after a busy day and somebody actually sent in a question, um, you know, just about most of our days being filled with activity that we acquire a lot of social interaction and a lot of critical thinking and this sort of mental activity that our daily life, our jobs require, it, it does support the habit of being disconnected with the body. So then you come home, like we many of you have, or you stop working, you're at home, but you stop working and you get invited to be present with the body. And what do we discover? Well, initially the discovery, there's a lot of physical tension, the sort of residual armoring, the residual lack of awareness, all of the karmic consequences for what the mind has been up to these last hours and years and lifetimes. Then that's what we feel when we are invited to be aware of the body. We feel the twisted steel. We feel the heaviness. We feel the hardness, the numbness. We feel the tension. So it seems on the surface that this can't be the way. And we fall back into that habit. I wanna fix this. I wanna get away from this. And we basically end up laying down another layer of tension, basically another layer of unwholesome karma in terms of how the mind is relating to the body. So one way we can um, begin is just to reflect about our posture and to have a dignified posture, no matter what our body feels like. And that doesn't mean, that isn't like a, 
invitation to get tight with the body. But it's more like we respect that there's something here in the mind relating to the body. In a way, and I mentioned this, I think the first week, there actually isn't a body. There's only the experience of the mind knowing the body. That's what we know. We don't know the body. We know the mind knowing the body. The body is known through the mind. So we're aware of the mind, the sensitive mind knowing the body. This is why our idea of the body, the thoughts we have about the body really matter and it affects how we experience the body. If I think my body's a dead weight, then we should be surprised that it feels so much like a dead weight, you know, like a, a ball and chain, a big burden that I have this 62 year old body or whatever it might be. So when we, like we're doing now, cultivating our sitting posture for the 30 minute set, how might our sitting posture, wherever we're sitting, however our body is doing today, how might our posture reflect some sense that this is a, a very real, sacred working ground, the place where we over time, learn a thing or two about awakening, about the freedom that the Buddha and our spiritual ancestors talk about. In the same way that human beings have built beautiful temples over the centuries because they've been inspired. Right? So in a way, even with our aching bodies, we build a beautiful temple for our sitting practice. And of course, it's going to look different for each of us. And we're not trying to fit some ideal. But just what does a dignified, beautiful posture that reflects our interest in being released and relaxed? and our interest in being clear and awake. What does that kind of posture look and feel like right now, today? And as you sense into that, just take a few longer, deeper breaths in and out, just to make more subtle adjustments if they're needed, where you're consciously filling and emptying the lungs without rushing. Allow the eyes to lightly close if that feels appropriate for you or be slightly open if that's how you prefer. And eventually let the breathing become easy and natural. Trust the body to do the breathing, whatever that might be like. Opening and receiving all the sensations in the face and head. We feel the head there resting on the shoulders, supported by the neck. Any residual tension around the jaw and mouth. Any residual tension in the eyes and brow in the temples. And just feeling the entirety of the head and face 
for a little longer. Like a beautiful smile we receive in a loving and kind way. The experience of the head and face And we take the time to open to the throat and sides of the neck and back of the neck in the same way. Almost as if it's an act of devotion, just this willingness to be present to whatever is moving here in the neck and the throat, the sides of the neck, back of the neck. And again, we're really emphasizing this potential that there is a way to be relating to these sensations, to the experience here that's really beautiful and liberating and healing and all around good. And relating now to the tops of the shoulders, just letting the awareness, the sensitivity soak into the shoulders, tops of the shoulders and shoulder joints. And we practice not being afraid of any unpleasant sensations that might be present making sure to include things as they actually are in the body, part by part. We feel the clothes, the sleeves touching the skin of the upper arms. We feel the biceps and the underarms, uh, maybe some warmth, Feeling the sensations of the bend of the elbows, whatever that's like. And the forearms, just as they are. Back of the hands. See if you can notice the air touching the skin, perhaps at the back of the hands, the wrists. Feeling the pinky, the small fingers, both hands, and then the ring finger, both hands, the middle finger, the index fingers of both hands. and the thumbs, all the touch points, places of contact there with the hands and the palms, this sacred space of the heart being relaxed and intimate with the body part by part, arms and hands, shoulders and neck, throat, face and head, scalp. And then the chest, the front side of the torso so from the throat down, the collarbones, the front side of the ribs, the breastbone, the breasts, all the way down to the solar plexus. And feeling any movement there, the front side of the rib cage. And the sides of the ribs under the arms, 
perhaps feeling a little expansion and contraction, a little movement. And then into the back, the shoulder blades, back of the shoulders and the kidneys, the spine, the upper spine. And any internal organs there. And from the diaphragm and kidneys, we just begin to open to the front side of the lower part of the torso, the abdomen and all the abdominal organs, the muscles here. All the way down through the groin to the pubic bone. And then from the kidneys down through the lower back and the lower spine and the back of the hips, feeling the floor, the pelvis and the sits bones, the anus, the structure of the pelvis. And again, the sense of sacred ground, sacred grounding. This possibility of real beauty and goodness as the heart mind opens intimate and relaxed with the body, trusting, allowing the body to be what it is. Feeling the hip sockets and taking our time to feel down both thighs, just the obvious touch points. Any places of contact or even the clothes, the pants against the skin, temperature of the skin. Feeling the bend of the knees. And the shins. And the calves. down through the ankles to the heels. Sides and tops of the feet all the way into the toes. Bottoms of the feet. really deeply trusting, opening to the sacred ground of the body, this marriage of awareness and body, fearless, kind, unwavering presence, The wisdom, the heart that knows how to allow things to be the way they are.
And the body is just the body. The body is just skin and flesh and bones. But it's possible to be deeply present and intimate and relaxed and allowing free from attachment in a way that's liberating. So we're gonna do a few more simple body scans, just keeping in mind the ordinary nature of the body in order to tease out any idealism the mind might have. So we just again feel the head and face, but just recognizing the reality of skin along the head and face, which would include the hair of the head. But just that sense, use both the idea of skin, but also then the, any experience of skin. And the face, throughout the head, back of the head. And the neck, the throat, just skin. So we're just attuning to the reality of skin and around the shoulders, tops of the shoulders, down both arms, just skin. There is skin being known. Back of the hands and palms and fingers and nails, the fingernails. It's just skin and nails and the hair of the arms. And on the torso, same thing, awareness of the skin in the upper back and chest, sides of the ribs, skin, skin over the abdomen, over the lower back, over the buttocks and groin and pelvis skin of the thighs, around the knees and back of the knees, down through the calves and shins. And just sensing the skin around the feet, some of it thick with callus, and of course the nails, the toenails, just skin, skin of the body, Sensing the very natural non-attachment to skin. No need to be repulsed by the skin, but also no need to be attracted to the skin. It's just skin. And in this way, as I'm imagining my own skin, really not so different than anybody else's skin. It's just skin, maybe a slightly different color or more or less hair, tougher or softer, but basically skin is just skin. And now from the feet, as we go up, we'll pay attention to the sense of flesh. Again, not in any disgusting way, but just sensing into the feet, the fleshy, juicy parts the muscles, the tendons, just the flesh of the feet, the toes. And as we move up and sensing into the calves and the fleshy muscles and ligaments, the juicy parts there in the calves and up through the thighs. The 
using our imagination, it's just flesh. Of course, it's just flesh. And we take the time and let the awareness settle into the pelvis with a special interest in the sense of flesh in the pelvis. And throughout the abdomen, so all the organs here, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments, it's just flesh. Lots of flesh in the abdomen and throughout the chest, all the organs up through the throat, through the tops of the shoulders, the fleshy muscles here, and on both arms, sensing the flesh. Even down through the wrists and into the palms, there's flesh in the hands as well. Underneath the skin, each pad of each finger, a little flesh. And even throughout the head, the brain, all the fleshy parts in the head, in the mouth, sinuses, there is this flesh, neither repulsive nor beautiful, it's just flesh throughout the body. You can see we're cultivating a cool, equanimous relationship with the body by remembering it's just skin and flesh and bones. So we're gonna go down through the body again, but now we're going to be attentive to the sensing of the bones, the hardness. So as we feel the head now, just attuning to the skull and the hardness of the jaw and the teeth in the jaw, even the cartilage around the nose. And just sensing the bones of the head, the hardness here and the upper spine connecting with the skull. Feel that spine and the collarbones, shoulder joints, the bones of the arms and hands, all the little bones in the hands, chest bones, lots of bones, feeling, sensing the structure of the rib cage, surrounding the spine, the breastbone, and the cartilage that holds the rib cage together, sternum, and the spine down into the lower spine and the incredible structure of the pelvis, quite thick, it's thick bones here. And where the pelvis and the thigh bones connect, the bones of the thighs, the structure of the knees and shins, all the way down to the heel and all the bones through the ankle and feet to the toes and the little bones of the toes. Lots of hard bones, teeth, just bones. And again, just sensing the, the bones here and getting, understanding that they're neither, these bones are neither attractive nor repulsive. They're just bones, skin, flesh, and bones. 
And it's not just our body. You could bring a good friend to mind and realize that in terms of their body, just skin, flesh and bones. Our pets, skin, flesh and bones. Our parents, our family, made up of, the bodies are made up of skin and flesh and bones. So for a couple minutes, just contemplating this in a natural, relaxed way, not meant to be repulsive. It's more meant to be grounding, sobering. Of course, the body is just skin and flesh and bones. So go ahead and take a moment to adjust the body, doing our best to stay connected even as we move. Skin, flesh and bones. So uh, I know some of you know that this is a interpretation or variation of the traditional 32 body part reflection from Venerable Analio, this a bhikkhu, Buddhist monk from Germany who has been teaching now in the West um, and is mostly living at the Barry Center for Buddhist Studies, one of my teachers. Um, we're grateful for his presence. And I've sent out to all of you, hopefully all of you are on our Buddhist Studies email list. And I sent um, Venerable Analio's guided meditation on body parts using this simplified version of skin, flesh, and bones. And I really encourage you to listen to that guided meditation at least once and as often as it is useful over these next weeks. Um, and we'll be using several other uh, Venerable Analio's um, guided meditations as we continue our mindfulness of the body. And one of the things you'll notice and I uh, really appreciate this teaching point because sometimes we hear instructions about mindfulness of the body, about bringing a bare attention to sensation, let's say, where we're feeling the hardness or the softness. Or, and there can be, I think, a confusing point that we sometimes hear that somehow the awareness of the body is non consistent and I understand I sometimes will say things like that like uh, you know more what you're feeling not what you're thinking what's the sensation not your thought or your mental image of the body but that is that doesn't imply that there won't be thought in Buddhist meditation it's not so much we're trying to get rid of thought as much as it is we want any thinking any mental activity to be in the service of being 
intimate, being aware of the way it is in a way that's liberating. So instead of making thinking or any mental activity the bad guy that needs to be destroyed or gotten rid of, it's more about how thinking and any kind of mental activity can be in the service of seeing things as they are in a way that's liberating, in a way that supports us letting go of what's extra, what's not helpful. That we would call wise thinking (laughs) as opposed to unwise thinking. Unwise thinking in a kind of simple way is thought or thinking patterns that just lead to more thinking, that endless mental proliferation, right? And then generally the mind gets absorbed or identified with those, that mental proliferation. And so it doesn't even realize it's thinking. It's so lost in the thinking that it's even the mind is unaware that I'm obsessing or planning or worrying or whatever the particular nature of that thinking is. And this is especially important now as we look at this very important discourse, the Satipatthana Sutta. It's the Buddha's discourse on the foundations of mindfulness, four foundations, mindfulness of the body, which of course is what this course is about. In the spring, we'll do mindfulness of feeling tone, um, mindfulness of the mind in the summer, And then in the fall, for those of you who are still doing the Buddhist studies, we'll be doing mindfulness of dhammas, the sort of qualities of mind, qualities, the pattern or process of awakening as an activity in the mind or as a realization in the mind, how the mind abandons the hindrances and develops this profound balance with the awakening factors. That's the fourth foundation that we'll discuss in the fall. So in this discourse, and in particular in this discourse in the section on mindfulness of the body, the Buddha is offering, uh, in particular, three meditative trainings. One which we did tonight, or we did an interpretation of it tonight, which were using bodily body parts, and we simplified it, or Venerable Analio simplifies it to just skin, flesh, and bones. But traditionally, and I'll read that in a a few minutes, the Buddha divided into 32 parts, basically an an anatomy lesson, at least as they understood the body parts back at the time of the Buddha, when they kind of got most of them. Um, And the idea, you know, because like, I don't know about you, but it's not so easy to feel skin everywhere or flesh everywhere, or bones everywhere. We have to use our imagination in combination with the felt sense of the body, right? So this is the point I was making, like we always wanna feel free to use thinking and imagination and any mental activity skillfully in the service, service of what we're trying to do. And so what are we trying to do with this reflection? Well, a lot of the teachings in the Satipatthana Sutta, this discourse the Buddha gave on mindfulness, isn't so much about what you should be mindful of. We sort of know the answer about what we should be mindful of. What should we be mindful of? The present moment, right? But that's easier said than done. Because when I sort of like with my ordinary, not well-trained mind, and and someone tells me, be mindful of the present moment. So I take my awareness and I bring it to the present moment, but unbeknownst to me because of habit, I'm just lost in thought. So a lot of what's conveyed in this discourse, this teaching from the Buddha is how do we correct the way we view reality so that we can actually be intimate. So the first three instructions that we're going to be covering over the next three weeks, the Buddha is giving us a contemplation that will help correct the way we relate to the body. So because our body is all nicely wrapped up in skin, you know, and then on top of that, we have clothes on most of the time, 
you know, and other decorations with our bodies, you know, we tend to um, have opinions about bodies and there are bodies we're attracted to and there are bodies we ignore that we're not attracted to. And we have all kinds of ways that we classify bodies based on color of skin, projection of, you know, how we see, understand somebody's gender or sexual orientation by based on some superficial markings, often not very skillfully, like we mis, mischaracterize or misjudge the situation. So the Buddha uses this image. I'll just share the, the discourse here. First, he has this simile, you know, before he goes through the 32 parts or after actually, but he uses a simile that really helps us understand the Buddha isn't trying to make us disgusted by thinking about the flesh of the body. Or even when he breaks it down, you know, some of the parts obviously are going to be like what's inside of our intestines, you know. Well, it's not pretty, <laughs> but it is just what it is, right? And so, but the image he uses is the uh, two hold bag that farmers used to seed their field, field. So at the top of the bag, bigger hole, where the farmers would put the seeds, you know, whatever they're going to be planting. And then the bottom of the bag is a smaller hole where why they're walking along the um, furrows, I guess it's called, right? They're able to drop the seeds into the place where the seeds are going to be planted. And then, you know, whether you had sesame seeds or mustard seeds or ses uh, sunflower seeds or corn seeds or whatever it might be, these, the, a wise person would be able to discern, oh, that's a kidney bean, that's a sunflower seed, that's a sesame seed, that's a pea, that's a this, that's a that. There's nothing disgusting about that simile, is it? you know, a bag filled with a bunch of different seeds and somebody like the image the Buddha uses just as a person with good eyes who has opened a double mouthed bag full of different sorts of grain, such as rice, beans, peas, millet, which they would examine. This is this kind of seed. This is that kind of seed. These are beans, those are peas, this is millet, right? There's nothing repulsive in that image that the Buddha gave. So this is really important because there is some tendency to think of this body contemplation as, and even the words get translated as disgust sometimes. But what we're really doing is trying to break the spell, that habit of seeing a body all wrapped up and thinking, I like that body. Because it's really helpful to realize, I mean, it's totally fine to like a body, <laughs> you know, the, like the way it looks, whether it's your body or another body. I mean, we look in the mirror a lot and sometimes hopefully you think, okay, looking good. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, ooh. But the point is, is to step, break the spell of, liking and disliking in terms of the body to break that, that spell and to have a much cooler, equanimous, ordinary relationship. Well, it's just skin, flesh, and bones. But that isn't about being disgusted by the body. It's just about understanding, oh yeah, it actually is just skin, flesh, and bones. And whether you do it in that simple way, dividing into these three categories, or you do it in a more intricate way, the 32 body parts. I'll just go through that just so you have a sense of that. And this is just a translation from the Satipatthana. One examines the same body up from the soles of the feet, down from the top of the hair, right? Just like we did a body scan, enclosed by skin, full of many kinds of objects, you know, objects that are not pretty, that are not inherently beautiful. They're just what they are. 
So it goes on, in this body, there are head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinews, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, bowels, contents of the stomach, feces, bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, and urine. Well, that kind of sums it up. And uh, actually in the, in the early Buddhist tradition, these, this contemplation of body parts was used as a powerful concentration practice. I mean, it's sort of strange to, to think of it this way, but where somebody might, you know, they'd memorize the list and they just repeat it almost like a mantra and just contemplate. So it's using the word, you know, of each of these 32 parts to challenge the habit of our mind to organize the body as a thing. Like some of us have objects in our home that we love. For some of you, it might be, you just like really think your car is a cool car, you know, and others it's like, you've got the iPhone 12, you know, one of the best cell phones out there. And others, it's gonna be a priceless vase or a really nice kitchen utensil that you really like, a coffee maker that you just think is great or a pair of slacks or, so whatever it is, there's, it's just a natural, powerful thing we can do is just deconstruct that thing. So if, just as an example, if it's the car for you, you know, just in your imagination, okay, there's the muffler and you picture that there's the carburetor, there's all the wiring. You just put all the wiring in a little pile, you know, there's the upholstery of the car seats. There's the glass, you put that in one pile. There's the metal, the sheet metal of the body of the car, all the paint on the surface of the body. There's the gasoline you put over there and you just break it down. And all of a sudden that special car of yours isn't so special. It's just a bunch of pieces of stuff. And the same, you know, if you took all the threads that make up your favorite pair of slacks or if you you know, all the little bits and pieces of your cell phone or of your favorite piece of artwork or whatever it might be in your home. Because the Buddha wants to challenge, help us challenge our habitual ways of perceiving the body so we can have a more honest and neutral relationship to the body. Now, it's important that we, we have a sense that we don't really know where this leads until we play with it. We take it up as a practice. So one of the reasons of taking these Buddhist studies classes, you know, uh, most of you know, these, they go on for years. There's a uh, six-year curriculum, four classes a year, usually eight weeks. And they're just these different meditative, contemplative trainings that help the mind um, challenge and unhook from our habitual ways of perceiving. And it's our habitual ways of perceiving the world that keep us locked into greed, hatred, and delusion, and all the suffering that that sets in motion. Not all the suffering in my own heart, but all the suffering in the world because of these habits of perception. Now in this class, we're really focusing in particular especially these next several weeks on our habitual ways of understanding and perceiving the body. We think we know what the body is. This is called delusion. What we know is our habitual way of understanding the body, right? And that is generally in terms of bodies I like, bodies I don't like, I find repulsive, and all the rest of the bodies that I tend not to even notice, right? We have the people, we have bodies, and it may be our own body that disgust us. And we have the bodies that we think are great. And we have all the other bodies we tend not to pay attention to. And we don't even, doesn't even occur to us that's just a bunch of mental construction. 
that we've been sort of caught up in and we don't even realize it's all made up. It's all construction, how we're perceiving bodies. So the next three weeks today with the body parts, next Monday we'll look at the four elements as another way to deconstruct how we perceive the body. And then the following week, we'll look at the corpse meditation or just at the impermanence of the body. Because one of the things we don't necessarily often perceive in our bodies is that, yeah, it's all kind of held together now, but it won't always be this way. This body will fall apart. Right. I remember growing up as a Catholic, you know, it was a very provocative uh, ceremony. Some of you remember, you know, where Ash Wednesday, and I forget exactly the phrase now, but basically it was a reminder that, yeah, back to dust, you know, this body will return to its dust like nature. <coughs> Excuse me. So, we, you know, we find this in human culture, this understanding that we want to uh, cultivate a more honest relationship with the body. So I'll send out the list of the 32 body parts. I forgot to send that in today's email. And that way you'll be able to, for those of you who want to do it in a more systematic way, you can either print out a copy of the 32 parts or write it out. And then you can just contemplate each part and you can even do as i sort of described you know where you put the nails of your fingers in one pile like using your imagination of course <laughs> toenails in another pile put all the bunch of skin in one pile the hair of the head here the hair of the body over there the intestines the lungs all the blood all the lymph all the and you're just sort of using the list. You could use an actual anatomical list or you could use the traditional 32 body parts, which you know, isn't as complete as our current you know, list of anatomy, but pretty good for 2,500 years ago. And, and just contemplate all those, you know, just, oh yeah, that's the body's made up of these parts. And then bring that simile of the seeds because it's a very neutral simile. You know, most of us don't have an emotional charge around seeds. <laughs> you know, it's just, oh, they're just seeds. And that's like a really important invitation. Oh yeah, it's just body parts. It's just the way it is. This body's made up of body parts. We're not, it's not a hard sell. We're just sort of letting it sink in. Oh yeah, there is just skin and a bunch of fleshy stuff and the bones. That's what the body is. And it's not that we're saying that's who I am. We're just saying that's what the body is. We're helping to correct any conditioned habits of how the mind perceives and understands the body. And understanding, oh yeah, it's just, it's just what it is. And the, uh, this is from Bhante Gunaratana, a, a well-known here in the West, a well-known Sri Lankan monk. Uh, he's quite old now. He's got to be in his 90s. Um, and he's written several good books, including one on the Eightfold Path. And in that book, I think it's called Eight Mindful Steps to Happiness or something like that by Bhante Gunaratana. If you relax your mind and watch your breathing, uh, you could just substitute body here. If you relax your mind and watch your breathing and body without desiring calmness and without resenting the tension that arises, experiencing only the impermanence, dissatisfaction and selflessness of the breath of the body, the mind becomes peaceful and calm. So we're using these contemplations like this week, deconstructing the body in terms of parts. We're using that. And what you're looking for is that cool balance. And you're trying to sense that that cool balance of mind, that wise, cool balance, 
not attached way of relating and knowing and being with the body, you want to discern that feels really right. That feels really good. As if this is our new way, you know, this is our aspiration to begin to relate, not just to the body, although that's our working ground for this course, but really to relate to everything in that unwavering, that very stable, but cool, clear, honest, grounded way. And it really changes how we understand what happiness is from a more intense happiness of, you know, getting pushed around by life and competing and, you know, all of that to a happiness of seeing clearly and this, the balance that comes with it. I'll try to remember, Karen, to send that quote out um, in the email with the 32 body parts. And so um, I think I might have mentioned this uh, in week one, but a lot of the Buddhist teachings are really uh, directed about, directed toward this transformation of understanding how our heart relates to sensuality, relates to the world and relates to the body. And so in this sense, the, the body is a very real and concrete manifestation of sensuality in the world. The way the mind relates to the body is kind of the set up for how the mind relates to all of sensuality, all sense experience, the world. So if we really take the way the mind is relating to the body as a particular place of study, it's going to have ripple effects to how I'm relating to everything in the world. So that's just a way of um, just inspiring us to to take up the study. So I have a few minutes left. I thought maybe I'll just uh, address a couple of questions that came in and in about seven minutes I'll divide us up into small groups for those who can stay. And I'll say a little bit more about what you might talk about in those groups in just a moment. And I mentioned uh, that I got a couple questions in and remember you can always send your questions in um, and then I'll try to address them in the following week. So at any point, just send the questions to my email address. Um, but Dave sent in a question about um, trying to build continuity of present moment awareness in particular, given his life requires a lot of intellectual and critical thinking, which is often the case, people in their jobs. And he wrote, I do research type work on the computer all day. I find that especially during a task like writing, the critical mind really needs its space to wander through thoughts and concepts. During these periods, I find that the defilements often creep in unseen by mindfulness. <clears throat> I sometimes will do a sit right after working on a writing project, and it becomes quite clear how the mind has gotten really stirred up. Many thoughts are racing about, and many of them are seductive off ramps from being present with the body. And then he goes on to talk about he's you know, it just one strategy he's used is take small breaks. And that makes a lot of sense. It's really useful to punctuate those times in our life where our mind is getting absorbed in some activity. So that, that breath, because wisdom that understands the causes of suffering needs that breath of awareness. It has to be reading cause and effect even while you're in conversation or even while you're reading 
some instruction or whatever you might be doing. And that takes some training to sustain that overview of the, of the activity of the body and the mind that is basically aware of what's happening and how the mind is relating to what's happening and whether we're planting seeds of suffering, stress, or planting seeds of release. That's a tall order, right? It takes some training. And now we really, when you get a question like Dave's question, we really understand why so much of our training, we go into a quiet room, we sit in a comfortable way, we hold the body still, right? We're creating kindergarten for ourselves where it's a little bit easier to develop that breadth of awareness that can read cause and effect, the causes for stress and the causes for release, when all we have to do is sit and breathe and hear and see and think, right? Because we can't shut those things off. We're a seeing, we have a seeing body, a hearing body, a thinking mind, and a feeling body, right? In terms of sensations. So even when we're in that quiet room, sitting still, that stuff still happens. Even when we close our eyes, we're still seeing to some degree, right? But it's a lot simpler than when we're writing an article, right? That's a more graduate level practice. So like Dave suggests, one thing you can do, and you can even, I think I sent an email that somebody sent in about they set their timer. It might've been Jennifer, I forget who sent it in. Um, but just setting your timer at an interval that won't drive you crazy, maybe every 30 minutes initially or every 45 minutes. And when that, just a simple sound, not a complicated sound, then it's almost like, oh yeah, I can just take a breath. I can drop the awareness into the body. Even if it's a busy day, I can take 15 seconds or 30 seconds and put everything down and just be real with the reality of the body. But more and more, we wanna cultivate a pervasive sense of the body, even to the degree where we start to appropriately sense that it's dangerous to be unaware of the body. Even when we're writing an article, even when we're in heavy duty intellectual territory, we want to keep open to the possibility that we can have an awareness of the body. So even right now, I'm going to say a little bit more, just see if you can stay aware of your body, even as you're hearing me talk. Isn't it possible to keep those roots of awareness deep in the body so that if there's some greed in your mind, as you're hearing me talk, like you really want to get it, you'll feel the tension in your body or if there's a real receptive, trusting awareness of what I'm saying, then you might notice that relaxation in your body. Um, another person, Anne, sent in a question, just asking me to expound on the importance of present moment awareness and why is it the ultimate goal? It's not so much the ultimate goal, although it isn't wrong to think of it that way. It's more as the essence of the path. Like if the real problem in being a human being is that I have these chronic habits of misperceiving what's going on, and because I'm misperceiving, greed, hatred, and delusion always feel like appropriate motivations. And you know, when I say greed, hatred, and delusion, it's often sort of subtle. You know, I'm not ravishingly greedy and lustful or you know, terribly hateful and violent or completely disconnected and deluded. But there are the, you know, my mind is often tainted with some greed, some aversion and fear, some disconnection and delusion. And so it's the continuity of mindful awareness. It's the stability and continuity and sensitivity of mindful awareness that really helps us go from a mind that is dominated by greed, hatred, and delusion, and all the stress that goes with that, to a mind that is governed by 
full of non-greed, which is generosity and contentedness and non-hate, which is love and non-delusion, which is clarity. And when we realize moments of a mind that is non-greed, non-hate, non-delusion, we, th- we realize that mind is free of grasping. That mind is free of the tension, the grip of craving. And we realize the liberation of craving. That's Nibbana, right? That's one of the ways the Buddha talks about Nibbana as a liberation from craving. So in the small groups tonight, you know, it's just an opportunity to talk about continuity of mindfulness, what has really supported that thread through the day of mindfulness of the body and in your formal sitting times, what techniques help you to sustain that present moment awareness and how does the awareness of body really give us a window into whether I'm planting seeds for stress or planting seeds for release, right? It's not about being mindful of the body. It's being mindful of the body so we can be more free. The body teaches us, mindfulness of the body teaches us how we're sowing the seeds of stress and how we're sowing seeds of release because the body is transparent and being more concrete it's easier, easier for wisdom to read when we're being unskillful and when we're being skillful. The body's the innocent victim here, but it can be a really powerful sort of mirror or teacher for what's going on in the mind. And that would be great to share. And of course, your response to the guided meditation tonight, you might wanna share in the small group. So I'll send out uh, some of the quotes and some more information about the more formal 32 body part reflection that you can play with. But otherwise, just use Venerable Analio's guided meditation. I think it's just 20 minutes and it's, I think, quite good. Maybe it's 24 minutes. So um, use that at least once this week, if you would. And uh, I'll say good night to some of you, but I'm hoping most of you will stay for the small groups, 20 minutes. You'll be in groups of three, but I'll say good night to those who have to leave.